This program is made possible by BibleWayMedia.org, overseen by the Uloga Church of Christ in Uloga, Oklahoma. You're listening to Opening the Scriptures with Don Boyd. Welcome to the program today. This is Don Boyd with the Moody Church of Christ. I want to thank you for tuning in to Opening the Scriptures. We're going to continue our studies today in the book of Job, in Job chapter 34. Elihu has already begun speaking, and he is continuing his speech here in chapter 34. And in this chapter, he's going to make the point that God cannot be brought on trial before a human court. Just because human beings do not understand why things are happening to them does not mean that God is acting unrighteously. Elihu will speak on the moral character of God and scold Job of his acting irreverent toward God. In verses 1 through 4, Elihu first turns his attention to Job's friends to consider what he will say. So Elihu apparently waited for a reply from Job and none forthcoming. He continued his discourse, chapter 34, verse 1. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said. Well, Elihu addresses Job's three friends to examine some of the things that Job had said in verse 2 of chapter 34. Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. So Elihu is asking them to listen carefully so they would know what is right the true state of Job's case and his accusations against God. In verse 3, Elihu asked them to listen to his words and test them just as their mouth would test the flavor of food. Job 34, verse 3. For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. So Elihu is telling him to determine if he is speaking the facts of the situation and if his opinion on the matter is sound or unsound or or good or not. Elihu wants to examine the situation and determine what is right. Job 34, 4. Let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. So do not contend for victory over Job but aim to look at the correct views and notions of all things and find out what is right. Well, Elihu now makes a charge against Job, and that is Job 34, verses 5 through 12. In verse 5, Elihu begins rehearsing what Job has said. Job 34, 5. For Job has said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Well, Job made or implied those statements at least in two places. Go to Job 13, 18 first. Job chapter 13, verse 18. He says, Behold, now I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. And then go to Job 27, verse 2. Job 27, 2. As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty, who hath vexed my soul. Well, Job's statements were made in vindication of his character that was being assassinated by his three friends. Job never said that he had not sinned. But he did say that God had afflicted him so harshly without reason. In verse 6, Elihu continues to rehearse what he thinks Job meant by what he said. Job 34, 6. Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. So these words were not spoken by Job. But Elihu believes this is the general feeling that Job had. So Job is asking if he should just lie and go along with his three friends, what they were saying about him, although he's innocent, 
and that his punishment is more than his sin deserves. Well, in verse 7 of chapter 34, Elihu accuses Job of being filled with scorn for God. Job 34, 7. What man is like Job who drinketh up scorning like water? That is a similar charge to what Eliphaz made against Job back in Job chapter 15, verse 16. Job 15, 16, Eliphaz said this, How much more abominable and filthy is man who drinketh iniquity like water? So there we have Job making, or Eliphaz making that same charge. Adam Clark stated this concerning this verse, and I quote, it is a proverbial expression and seems to be formed as a metaphor from a camel drinking who takes a long draught of water, even the most turbid, on it setting out on a journey in a caravan that it may serve it for a long time. Job deals largely in scorning. He fills his heart with it, unquote. Then in Job chapter 34, verse 8, Elihu says that Job's scornful attitude has identified him with wicked men. Job 34, verse 8. Which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity and walketh with wicked men. Well, Job had carried his resentment for his friends and God to excess. And he later confessed that he had done that. Well, Samuel Cox in the biblical illustrator made this statement, and I quote, There are points in the progress of the story where he seems to reveal in his sense of wrong and to lash out wildly against both God and man. With fine moral tact, Elihu had detected this fault in his tone and bearing and had discovered whether it was leading him, unquote. Now, in Job 34, 9, it appears that Elihu misrepresented Job in this statement. Verse 9, Elihu says of Job, For he has said it profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Well, Job made that statement, but what he was talking about is what the wicked would say, not what Job believed. Look at Job chapter 21, verses 14 through 16. Job 21, 14 through 16. And this is Job speaking. He says, therefore, they say unto God, they there being evil men, continuing verse 14, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways, what is the Almighty that we should serve him, and what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. So Job did make that statement that Elihu is accusing him of, but we see here that Job is actually saying what the wicked would say. Now, Elihu may be alluding to what Job said in 9.22 and taking that to mean what he charged Job with in Job 34.9. So let's look, look at Job 9.22 and see what Job said there. He says, This is one thing, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. So a couple of ideas there on chapter 34, verse 9. In chapter 34, verse 10, Elihu defends God's justice. Job 34, 10. Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Elihu saying that God is innocent. God always acts properly. God's justice cannot be questioned. Albert Barnes said in his commentary in this quote, In this he pursues the same course substantially which the friends of Job had done. 
and does little more to solve the real difficulties in the case than they had. The facts to which Job had referred are scarcely adverted to. The perplexing questions are still unsolved. And the amount of all that Elihu says is that God is a sovereign and there must be an improper spirit when people presume to pronounce on his dealings, unquote. Elihu then says that God will treat each man as he deserves. Job 34, 11 says, For the work of man shall he render unto him, and cause every man to find according to his ways. So God will judge each man according to his works. We know that from several passages. I'm just going to look over in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, we read there verses 12 through 13. And it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their work. So Job understands that as well. And Elihu understands that also. Well, Albert Barnes says this on Job chapter 34, verse 11, and I quote, Elihu does not indeed apply it to the case of Job, but there can be little doubt that he intended that it should have, been such, have such a reference. He regarded Job as having accused God of injustice for having inflicted woes on him which he by no means deserved. He takes care, therefore, to state this general principle that with God there must be impartial justice, leaving the application of this principle to the facts in the world to be arranged as well as possible, unquote. In Job 34, 12, Elihu states the fact that God cannot do wickedly, Job 34, 12. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. Elihu feels that this point is so important that he restated it, and he dwells on it. Well, in verses 13 through 30, Elihu points out that God can only do what is right. So he's dwelling on this fact. In verses 14 and 15, or excuse me, verse 13, Elihu affirms that no one had to give God authority to rule the earth. He already has that authority. Job 34, 13. Who hath given him a charge over the earth? Or who hath disposed the whole world? God is the great ruler of everything, and he is in subjection to no one. And then in verses 14 and 15, Elihu states the fact that if God wanted to, he could suspend all life and every human would perish. <clears throat> Excuse me. Job 34, 14 and 15. If he set his heart upon man, if he gather himself unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again to dust. Albert Barnes says concerning these two verses, and I quote, If God wished such a thing and should set his heart upon it, he could easily cut off the whole race. He has power to do it, and no one can deny him the right. Man has no claim to life, but he who gave it has a right to withdraw it, and the race is absolutely dependent on this infinite sovereign. If God chose... <clears throat> He would have a right to cut down the whole race. How then shall people complain of the loss of health, comforts, and friends, and presume to arraign God as if he were unjust? Unquote. Well, now, in verse 16 of chapter 34, Elihu appears to turn his attention to Job. Job 34:16. If now thou hast understanding, hear this, hearken to the voice of my words. So Elihu appeals to Job to answer 
whether what he has said is correct and that what Job had implied, that he had implied these severe reflections on the character of God. In verse 17, Elihu asked that if God was unjust, how could he rule the universe? Job 34, 17. Shall even he that hateth right govern? And wilt thou condemn him that is most just? It would be impossible <clears throat> to believe that one so unjust, if God was unjust, could rule the world. Elihu is telling Job that he is close to condemning the ruler of the universe. And then Elihu uses an earthly example to show Job his mistake in questioning God. And that's Job 34 verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked, and to princes ye are ungodly? How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they all are the work of his hands. Albert Barnes states this concerning these two verses, and I quote, The argument here is this. There would be gross impropriety in arraigning the conduct of, of an earthly monarch and using language severely condemning what he does, respect is due to those of elevated rank. Their plans are often concealed. It is difficult to judge of them until they are fully developed. To condemn those plans and to use the language of complaint would not be tolerated and would be grossly improper. How much more so when that language refers to the great, the infinite God and to his eternal plans, unquote. So God shows no favoritism or partiality on account of the rank or wealth of a person. God is impartial in his judgment of human beings and we are all created by him. In verse 20, Elihu states that even the mighty can be taken away by God, Job 34, 20. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. This affirms again that God is no respecter of persons. Both the mighty and the poor will die. They pass away in death, and they enter into their grave. John Gill made this statement concerning these verses, and I quote, or this verse, and I quote, Without the hand of men, but by the immediate hand of God, not falling in battle or in a common natural way by diseases, but by some judgment of God upon them. And the whole verse seems to be understood not of a natural death, or in the common way, but of a sudden death in a way of judgment from the immediate hand of God and that upon the mighty and great men of the earth, which shows that he is no respecter of princes, unquote. In verses 21 and 22, Elihu confirms that God knows all of man's ways and there is no place for the wicked to hide. Job 34, 21, and 22. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. God knows all of our internal thoughts and all of our external actions. Turn over to the book of Psalms and look at Psalm 139, <clears throat> verses 1 through 11. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 11. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest, or searches out, my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. 
thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell or Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. So there is no way, no place we can go that God is not there. And God, again, knows what we think. He knows why we do the things that we do. And he knows the things that we do. Well, in verse 30, 23 excuse me, of Job 34, <clears throat> Elihu declares that God is holy, just, and good, and all of his ways are right. Job 34, 23. For he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter judgment with God. So God cannot be called into question by mankind. God's decisions are just, and his actions are without appeal. In Job 34:24, Elihu states that God just steps in and does what's right. Job 34:24. <clears throat> he shall break in pieces mighty men without number and set others in their stead. God crushes the great, the wicked, no matter how many there may be. God always provides for a succession in the world. By that we mean, for example, the world was destroyed by the flood and Noah's family was saved to replenish the earth. When the carcasses of the unfaithful Israelites fell in the wilderness wanderings, another generation took their place, etc., etc. In verse 25 of Job 34, Elihu declares that the all-knowing God <clears throat> knows of man's evil deeds and renders judgment accordingly. Job thirty four twenty five. Therefore he knoweth their works and he overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed. So God knows what they have done, what they are planning to do, and in a single night can destroy them. Let's look at an example over in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. It says there, In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. That night, whenever the fingers of a man's hand came over and wrote on the wall and Daniel came and gave that interpretation, but that is how suddenly those who are in power, their lives can come to an end just like that. Well, Elihu says in verse 26 of Job 34 that God strikes the wicked down in the sight of all men, Job 34, 26. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others. So their sins may be committed in secret, but their punishment is done publicly. And then in Job 34, 27, Elihu highlights those who have turned away from the Lord. Job 34, 27. Because they turn back from him and would not consider any of his ways. This is the reason God dealt with them in judgment. They turned away from God in their hearts, and that showed itself in their moral character and their actions. In Job 34, 28, Elihu says, These evil rulers were cruel and oppressive to the poor. Job 34, 28. 
so that they cause the cry of the poor to come unto him, and he heareth the cry of the afflicted. God hears the cries of the poor and the afflicted. And then verse 29, Elihu affirms that God acts as he will toward nations and toward individuals. Job 34, 29. When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him? Whether it be done against a nation or against a man only. Albert Barnes says, the, and I quote here, The idea which Elihu intends to convey is that God has all things under his control and that he can bring prosperity or adversity upon an individual or a nation at his own pleasure, unquote. And it is basically stated, if God gives peace, no man can cause trouble and nobody can question God's actions. In verse 30, Elihu states that God operates for the ultimate good of people. Chapter 34, verse 30. That the hypocrites reign not, lest the people be ensnared. This is all done to prevent wicked men from ruling over the people. In the Geneva Bible Translator's notes on Esau, they make this comment, and I quote, When tyrants sit in the throne of justice, which under pretense of an executing justice are hypocrites and oppress the people, it is a sign that God has drawn back his countenance of favor from that place, unquote. Now, in chapter 34, verses 31 to 37, Elihu now focuses on Job's case, the things that are happening there. In verse 31, Elihu says that a man's afflictions should lead him to reform his life. Job 34, 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend any more. God's chastisement, it is a fatherly ch affliction there, a fatherly chastisement. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 and look at verses 5 through 7. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. It says there, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastise, or chasteneth not? And in verse 8, But if thou be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are illegitimate and not sons. So here Elihu is referring to the fact that God's chastisement is like the chastisement to, of a father to a son. John Gill stated this concerning this verse, and I quote, I have borne and still do bear, and I am content yet to bear the chastisement of the Lord. I am desirous to bear it willingly, cheerfully, and patiently until he is pleased to remove it from me, unquote. In Job 34:32, Elihu encourages Job to Inquire of God and learn the things that he needs to know. Job 34, 32. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Well, knowing that God always does right, we should never complain or accuse God of being unjust. And if we have done wrong, then don't do it anymore. Just make that decision. 
don't do it anymore. In Job 34, 33, Elihu asked Job if God is required to do things according to his terms. Job 34, 33. Should it be according to thy mind? He will recompense it whether thou refuse or whether thou choose. And I, not I, therefore speak what thou knowest. <clears throat> Elihu is telling Job that he's going to have to choose how he will react to what Elihu has said and to what God does. But know that God always does what is right. If you know anything better or can contradict what I've said, then speak up and tell me. And then in Job 34, 34, Elihu says for Job and his friends to tell him if he is right or wrong. Job 34, 34. Let men of understanding tell me, and let a wise man hearken unto me. Now, I want to look at two other translations of this verse. The first one from the little, literal translation. It says, <clears throat> Men of heart will say to me, and a wise man who hears me will say. And then the American Standard Version, <clears throat> excuse me, said, Men of understanding will say to me, Yea, every wise man that heareth me. Now, some say that Elihu is saying that Job's three friends will say to him what follows. Others say that those who are wise and understanding will agree with what follows, what we're about to look at. So in Job 34, 35, <clears throat> Elihu says that Job has spoken like a man without wisdom and was careless in what he said. Job 34, 35. Job has spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. Well, Job's three friends would agree with that, and those who are wise and understanding would also agree with that. Albert Barnes makes this statement, and I quote, Elihu supposes every wise man who attended to him would concur that what Job had said was not founded in knowledge or on true wisdom, unquote. And then in verse 36, <clears throat> Elihu wants Job's words to be investigated because of the opinions that Job set forth, that wicked men are not punished in this life. Verse 36, my desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. Well, Job did say that the wicked prosper in this life. Let's go back and look at Job 21, verses 7 through 13. Job 21, 7 through 13. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, and are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp, and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth <clears throat> and in a moment go down to the grave. Well, Albert Barnes said concerning Job 34, 36, and I quote, Because of the views which he has expressed, which seem to favor the wicked, Elihu refers to the opinions advanced by Job that God did not punish in people in this life or did not deal with them according to their characters, which he interpreted as giving countenance to wickedness or as affirming that God was not the enemy of impiety. Elihu then in Job 34, 37 accuses Job of adding rebellion to his sin. <clears throat> Job 34, 37. For he addeth rebellion unto his sin 
he clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. Foyle Smith in the 16th Spiritual Sword Lectureship book on page 339 made this statement and I quote, this is an unfounded assertion because, number one, it had not been demonstrated that God had sinned, at least in the way that Elihu meant it, and number two, it was not shown that Job stood in rebellion to God, unquote. Well, to clap the hands here is used to show a mark of indignation. So Elihu is accusing Job of, of making a lot of talk against God. Adam Clark stated this, and I quote, an ill-natured, cruel, and unfounded assertion, borne out by nothing which Job had ever said or intended, and indeed more severe than the most inveterate of his friends, so-called, had ever spoken, unquote. So, in conclusion of chapter 34, Elihu does not seem to be the compassionate person he seems to be. He has accused Job of being vain, arrogant, heartless, and slanderous. Such are Elihu's opinions. But when we come to chapter 35, Elihu continues to respond what he sees as Job's error there. He already stated he was giving his opinion on the matter, and it again appears that Elihu paused to see if there was a reply by Job or his three friends. Again, nothing coming. Elihu continues his discourse. In verses 1 through 3, Elihu says what he thinks Job is implying in some of Job's statements. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 35, Elihu asked Job if he's questioning the fairness of God. Job 35, 1 and 2. Elihu spake moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, My righteousness is more than God's? Well, Job did not say this outright anywhere. But Elihu's opinion of what Job said is that Job was implying this in what he said. Albert Barnes made this comment, and I quote, He had dwelt much on his own sincerity and uprightness of life. He had maintained that he had not been guilty of such crimes as to make these calamities deserved. And he had indulged in severe reflections on the dealings of God with him. Compare Job 9.30 to 35 and Job 10.13 to 15. And we'll look at those momentarily. Now continuing to quote. All this Elihu interprets as being equivalent to saying that he was more righteous than his maker. It cannot be denied that Job had given occasion for this interpretation to be put on his sentiments, though it cannot be supposed that he would have affirmed this in so many words, unquote. Now let's go look at the references that Barnes is making here. Job 9, 30 to 35. Job 9, 30 to 35. <laughs> Job says, If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet thou shalt plunge me in the ditch and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon both us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and not let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak, and not fear him. But it is not so with me. And now the other reference is Job 10, 13 to 15. Job 10, 13 to 15. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know that this is with thee. If I sin, when thou, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me of mine iniquity. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my hand. I am full of confusion. Therefore, see thou mine affliction. 
So a couple of places here where Elihu is, is assuming this is what Job is meaning. Well, in verse 3 of chapter 35, Elihu elaborates on other things that Job has said. Job 35, 3. For thou saidst, What advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Well, Job, you said, is what he's saying, you said that your righteousness and holy life were of no benefit to you. You said that you might as well be wicked as well as righteous because you're no better off being righteous. Well, let's go look and see Job 9, 27 to 35. Now, we read part of this a while ago, but let's read some more. Job 9, 27 to 35. Job says, If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself, I'm afraid of all my sorrows. I know that they will not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, then why labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet thou, or shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me? For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Well, then we come to verses 4 through 16 of chapter 35, and Elihu says, He will answer Job and his friends. He first states that he will answer both Job and his friends in verse 4. I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. Elihu is going to try to explain more fully than Job's three friends did, where Job was in error. Eliphaz had proposed to do the same thing, but he went instead into severe charges against Job there in Job 22, verse 2. Job 22, verse 2, Eliphaz speaking, said, Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable to himself? But then he went on to attack Job. Adam Clark here says that in Job 35, 4, this is what Elihu is saying, and I quote, I I will show thee the evil of a sinful way and the benefit of righteousness and supply what thy friends have omitted in their discourses with thee, unquote. So Elihu tells Job and his three friends to look up and scan the heavens and see that the heavens are higher than they are in verse 5 of chapter 35. Look into the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. Elias is using this example to show Job that God is so great that he will not be affected by human conduct and that his dealings with people are totally impartial. Elihu then tells Job that God is not injured by his sins, no matter how multiplied they may be. Job 35, 6. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? So Elihu is saying that God does not gain anything or suffer any loss <clears throat> by the good or bad behavior of his creation. Now, we do know that God grieves whenever we sin but it doesn't change his character. Let's look at two passages. Joe, oh, excuse me, Psalm 78, verse 40. Psalm 78, verse 40. 
It says, How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Talking about those Israelites who did not make it into the promised land. They grieved God, but it didn't change his character. And then Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 10, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. And in verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that thing which I please, that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So God is higher than us. Elihu now tells Job that God is not benefited by Job's righteousness. Job 35, 7. If thou be righteous, what givest thou to him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? All human righteousness is like filthy rags compared to God. Go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, now, verse 6. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Notice also Luke 17, 10. Luke 17, verse 10. That verse says, So likewise, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So we do not benefit God or bring him under any obligation to us by the way that we live. <clears throat> Elihu then states, that whether Job was righteous or wicked, it would affect others, but it wouldn't affect God. Job 35, 8. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. Wayne Jackson on page 72 of his work, The Book of Job, made this comment, and I quote, he was not suggesting that Jehovah is unconcerned with human behavior. Rather, his point is God's actions of justice and benevolence toward man are self-determined and not man-centered, unquote. And then Foy L. Smith in the 16th Spiritual Sword Lectureship book on page 344 made this comment, and I quote, Of course God is hurt by our sins and pleased by our righteousness, but either way we choose to go, God will survive. We cannot destroy him. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, but whether Jerusalem repented or not, he would survive, Matthew 23, 37, unquote. Well, let's go look at that reference that he made, Matthew 23, 37. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Well, going back to Job 35, verse 9 now, <clears throat> he says that some do cry to God for relief. Job 35, 9. By reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason and the arm of the mighty. So Elihu is answering Job 
as to why God will not answer his prayers. Elihu says that those who cry out for relief are merely crying out because of pain and not to glorify God. That's verse 10. But none saith, Where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night? Albert Barnes made this comment on the verse, and I quote, <clears throat> This is a solution which Elihu gives of what appeared so mysterious to Job, and of what Elihu regarded as the source of the bitter complaints of Job. So the solution is that when people are oppressed, they do not apply to God with a proper spirit and look to him that they may find relief. It was a principle with Elihu that if when a man was afflicted, he would apply to God with a humble and penitent heart, he would hear him and would, not, and would withdraw his hand. Unquote. Now he mentions their songs in the night. Songs in the night is a reference to when everything seems to be going bad, those who are afflicted can rejoice. We have an example of that in Acts chapter 16, verses 23 to 25. Acts 16. 23 to 25. And this is Paul and Silas there being put into Philippian jail. Verse 23, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Giveth me songs in the night. The song redeemed by Fanny J. Crosby has that in the third verse. He giveth me songs in the night. Well, Elihu states that some cry out of pain, as do animals, and believe it is their God-given right to be relieved of that pain. Job 35, 11, and 12. Who teacheth us more than the beast of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven. There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. Dave Miller in class notes made this comment, and I quote, God is not ab obligated to answer your prayer when you want it and how you want it. Job, your demands that God answer you are not out of the right spirit. You should be humble and not claim to have a right, but ask a favor that is not deserved. Job needs an attitude adjustment, unquote. Elihu says that the pride of men causes them to complain against God for what is happening to them. And then Elihu tells Job that what he is demanding of God, God is, God is not obligated to give him. Job 35, 13. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. Elihu seems to believe that everyone that suffers and is not relieved by God, must be offering insincere prayers, and God will not listen to those prayers. Well, the Apostle Paul shows that Elihu's opinion here is, is not a correct assumption. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of, rev of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you think the Apostle Paul was sincere in his prayer to God to remove that thorn in the flesh? Absolutely. But God did not do that. 
Well, our time is about up for today, so we're going to stop right there, and we're going to start, Lord willing, next time in Job 35, 14. But again, this is Don Boyd, and I want to thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to being with you next time. When you're in Moody, Missouri, you're invited to visit the Moody Church of Christ, located on Highway E in Moody, Missouri. The congregation there meets on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for Bible class, 11 a.m. for worship, and then again at 6 p.m. for Sunday evening worship. They also meet at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night for Bible study. We thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can find out more about Bible Way Media by visiting us at BibleWayMedia.org. You can also find us on several uh, social media platforms now. You can find us not only on Facebook, but you can also can find us on Tumblr. You can also find us on the Twitter alternative known as Telegram and on the Facebook alternative known as MeWe. We hope you enjoyed this program. We hope you will share with others. And as always, we thank you for listening.